How often is that successful? Sometimes, right? How many of you ever had that work? You've tried to find easy ways to do hard things. How many of you found that often trying to do hard things easy ways makes them harder in the end? Because you got to kind of redo what you should have done the first time. All right, all right. All right, this morning we're here to talk about a vision to grow with. You know, we've been dealing with this idea of vision moving forward, and today is the day you get, you know, some of you are going to say, oh, I think I've heard that. And others are going to go, I had no idea. So, you know, this is the time we get to talk about vision. But I want to talk about for a moment all of the ways that sometimes people try to do hard things the easy way. One of the things that drives me crazy is stupid political drama. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not here to talk about anything you heard about lately. We've had a lot of stupid political drama lately. I, I understand that. Uh, how many of you know, though, that one of the things that irritates Pastor Jeff more than anything is politicians on both sides making promises they know full well they cannot deliver on? I mean, it's one thing to make something you're really trying to fight for. It's another thing when you know that it's just, you know, it, it, you're just pleasing the base. It has nothing to do with reality. And just for a second, and really only a second, I'll go two ways and show you that I'm not being biased. How many of you know that it's great to say everybody should make $15 an hour, but economic reality says that's not going to work? And if you don't like that and you think I'm being too conservative in every city that this has been tried, what happens is people lose jobs and lose hours. Because market forces simply don't work that way. So it's great to say everybody should have it because it's fair, but it doesn't really work. So politicians on one side can go and say, we're fighting for you, cheer us on. But they know in the end it's going to self-destruct, it doesn't really work, and they're smart enough usually to know that. On the other side, how many of you watch the conservative side try to say, we're going to defund Obamacare? We're going to do it. We're going to make it happen. And they did it. They tried and they tried. Last time I counted, there was like 51 votes to do it. How many of you know that everybody in the House understood that the Senate was never going to go with that? And if the Senate did it, that the President wasn't going to go with that. So they could promise to the base, we're going to do this for you. We're, vote for us. We're going to, they had no intention of it ever happening. And if you don't believe me, the conservative side that generally I would tend to be on has been in control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency for the last two years. They haven't re repealed Obamacare yet. They've chipped away. They made Okay, so it's one of the promises are easy when they're not deliverable. So if I stand before you as a pastor and I say, this is our church vision, and it's something that is undeliverable, well, that's kind of pointless, isn't it? So we don't want to get together today and talk about fuzzy things out there someplace. If you'll remember, when I talked about vision a few weeks ago, I said, if it isn't bigger than you are, if it isn't bigger than I am, if it isn't bigger than the sum total of our talents, our abilities, and our goals, then it really isn't a divine vision. It's just a nice goal. It could be useful, it could be helpful, it could make a difference, but it's not truly visionary. So yes, it should be big. But I don't believe, first of all, that visions are visions just because they sound big. Why do I say that? Well, how many of you have heard some vision statements before? Here or someplace else you've been a part of. And maybe you've seen them, and maybe you haven't. But I served for 10 years and two church staffs. And the, the second church I served at, great pastor, did a lot of wonderful things. His vision was to grow the church to a thousand people. Doesn't that sound like a great thing? How many of you would like to see a thousand people that don't know Jesus Christ be in here next week? Amen? I mean, it's hard for that not to be exciting. I mean, how many of you have ever been to church that really ran a thousand on average? Which means you got to have about 1,400 to make it work. Okay? I mean, it's kind of cool, isn't it? You look around, there's a lot of people. When it's time to sing, there's a lot of singing. And when you know, there's talent and there's ability, I mean, churches that are large have some neat things they can do at scale, right? I mean, you know, we do a small thing, and well, it's cool. They do a small thing, and not everybody knows about it, because it's big. That's sweet. But how many of you know that a lot of churches hit a thousand without really reaching a thousand new people in the kingdom? And I'm not picking on big churches. I think they're a great place. I think that God moves there. That's not my point. But oftentimes what happens is a church is built and just people kind of shuffle. 
and it's, you know, same believers just going to a different place. Again, is that bad? Is it wrong? Not my call. I'm just saying it's not always necessarily a great day for the kingdom alone unless those people are better served, better loved, better taught where they're at. Okay? Now, I just used the, the number 1,000 people. Again, that was my past pastor's passion because it sounded big. And big is cool. And so we wanted to do that. Is that my goal? Is my goal for there to be a thousand people here? Well, I can tell you, first of all, I'd love to see a lot of people come to Christ. But I, I think we'd lose something at a thousand people. Look around. You know, I think there are some wonderful healthy sizes for churches, and I think there are ways to do it. But one of the things that has made Sunrise Sunrise is a sense of family. I'm not saying that's impossible in a big church. It's very hard, though. So I think, I mean, honestly, if I could just kind of set a number anywhere, and the number is not my vision, by the way. It's just a number. I think a church that's running three to 400 people is really a pretty good church. You could have two services. You could know everybody in those services. You could still have some set of family. You'd have a greater sense of scale, a greater sense of ability. That'd be cool. It's not my vision. But it's a cool, healthy thing that I think would be wonderful and beneficial, and I'd love to see us do that someday. I think that's a healthy, positive thing. But so often, pastors will have undeliverable visions, or they'll have visions that sound great simply because they sound great. Now, I will say, in the last church that I served, he had a really comfortable church. I say comfortable, I'm not talking about complacent. I'm not talking about unspiritual. These were wonderful disciples of Jesus Christ, but there were about 375 of them. And he was frustrated with them all the time. Because there weren't a thousand. And he canned staff members. I lasted longer than anybody ever did in his entire career. Seven and a half years. But he canned staff members, mixed the pot up. In the end, his church got smaller, not bigger. Because somehow they didn't meet his grandiose number that he felt sounded so tremendously spiritual. I always felt a little bit bad because he had a great thing going. He would have been a wonderful church planter. Spent, send 50 off over here and 50 off over there. And he could replace 50 like that with his skill set. I mean, really could have. That would have been a glorious thing to do and he could have just touched the entire downriver area. But he wanted to get that one number and that one service really big and he was frustrated all the time. I feel sorry for him. In Sunrise... Our vision is not numeric, not mine. It's sunrise, here's our vision. I've said it before. Some of you have been around a while enough, you've heard this. And how many of you have ever thought something so long you start thinking, and what I'm thinking makes sense anymore? How many of you have ever questioned your own decisions? Did you question them correctly? How many of you have ever changed your mind when you thought about your decision? How many of you said, no, you know, I got it right the first time? <laughs> That's funny. Some of you go, oh, yeah, I changed. Some of you, you're laughing about the other one, but you're not committing to it. All right. <laughs> I have always felt, this is, what you, this is where we were going. I have always believed that God intended Sunrise to be a church that lives out its giftings to make a positive spiritual impact and an influence in the community that we are a part of. I've always felt that that's true. What does that mean? Number one, it, mean, it means that we have an exemplary impact on other churches. I believe as small as we are, we have the capacity as we live out the spiritual giftings, not as I preach pretty messages or as we do pretty buildings, but as we live out our giftings, I believe other churches see and sometimes notice and follow. Now that may sound a little odd to you, but how many of you know that in the last 20 years that has happened in Howell? There are things that little old sunrise that you and I have prayed and given to and have done that other churches didn't do 20 years ago and they're doing now. Why? Because we're smarter than everybody? No. Because I'm better than the next pastor? No. Because God said, this is kind of how you need to interact with your community. And we got the opportunity and we had the passion to do it. And you got involved and you showed up and you prayed and you funded and you believed. And other churches went, whoa, something's happening there that we ought to emulate. 
to be a church that uses and lives out its giftings to have a positive spiritual impact on and influence within its community means to have mature people working for God who serve in many of the bodies that find answers to the questions our community has. Too often in churches what happens is we kind of pull in. We look at our inside events our inside programs, our inside offerings. Do you realize that this is a place of training and a place of encouragement and a place of accountability that, like I mentioned last week, makes us stronger, more fit disciples to worship together and then to go out there and kick the devil's butt and get stuff done? Churches that simply pull in and go, oh, we just love Jesus in these four walls feels good. We hug ourselves all day. You know what I mean? I mean, churches can do that. I'm not saying we do. I'm just saying that can happen. That can be part of the, the environment, and we feel better about it. But the world is lost. The world is darkened. The world has issues. And you have answers. How many of you have ever woken up and felt like you didn't have answers? First question you had in the morning was, who am I and what am I doing here? <laughs> Been there, done that, understand. I, I had to get up this morning, the tour to Livingston started this morning at 8. I had to be there a little after 6, you know, so I was like, who am I, what am I, 5.30. You know, it, it can happen. Yes, I understand. But you know what? God has given you, through your understanding, through your walking with him, through digging into the word of God on a regular basis, he has given you answers to the problems of life. Don't you think the people with the answers should be the ones helping make the decisions? And by the way, I'm not necessarily talking about politics. I'm not terribly political. I think you get that. But there are so many groups, so many groups that are trying to figure out how schools should work. So many groups that are trying to figure out how communities should work, how finances should be there, how resources should be there. And you know what? Believers should be in those groups. Not because they're building careers or running for office, but because they know that the Jesus they serve has an opinion and an attitude towards how those things go. I believe that's what a church that lives out its giftings looks like. Third, I believe that a church that lives out its giftings is one that makes people outside the church wonder, what will those sunrisers do next? <laughs> what are they going to do? What's it going to be? Now, is that the type of statement you often hear as a vision? No. You often hear, we're going to build the best youth program. We're going to build the best building. We're going to build the best missions program, whatever. And I'm cool, but I think those things are byproducts of a healthy church vision. I don't think they are the vision. I think they're byproducts. When we're living as disciples, when we're invested in God's mission field, then I think all those other things start to flow. Because people get excited about the right goals. People get committed to the right processes. People are absorbing the right information, so they're ready to do the right things. If we sell ourselves short of that, it just simply doesn't work. Brent, is it a good idea when you see trash on the side of the road to put it in a trash receptacle? even though it's not your trash. It's healthy. Now, Brent does environmental science. He's brilliant at it. He does that well. Okay, it, it, will I solve all the world's environmental problems if I simply pick up other people's trash when I see it? No, it's a good idea. It's moving in the right direction, just like saying you want a thousand people, or just like saying you want the best musical program, or just like saying all of those things might be moving in the right directions, might be healthy, wonderful things, but they're only part of the journey and we want to move to the place we need to be now I had to ask myself when, when I you know Lord you've given me this you gave me this 21 years ago when I showed up and you know the fun thing is I've been around long enough now that I've seen some of it happen and I'm going to mention more of this in a minute but I honestly think this is something that is part not of my DNA it's part of your DNA and I'll get to that in a moment because it really makes a different difference where vision comes from. But for any of us to make a positive impact, we have to first understand, remember, the vision has to be bigger than us. Look around. Are we a giant church? How many of you know that in America, everybody assumes you gotta be big to do something? You ever hear of a guy named David? He wasn't particularly. 
Anybody here in the, in the Bible meant to hear of a guy named Ananias? I mean, there's a couple of them. There's an Ananias whose story ends well, and there's an Ananias that doesn't end so well. So let me clarify. I'm not talking about the Ananias who lies to the Holy Spirit and dies in church. That's not a vision. That's a mistake. I'm talking about the other Ananias who we find in Acts chapter 9, rather than Acts chapter 5, you know, a little later. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. I'll have you go there first. Now, the reason I ask this is so often we would say, but wait a second, is being a church where people live out their gifts and influence community, is that really big enough? Does that really require God to pull out the stops to make it happen? Let's read Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. But pastor, that's not a church vision. That, that's Ananias' vision. How big can that be? How many of you want to go see a thug and serial killer to this afternoon? That sounds like a good idea. Well, well, why would you say that? This is Paul. This is the guy that wrote half the New Testament. Do you know before this, he had been chasing Christians down? Trying to haul them into prison and make sure they were tortured or killed to recant their faith? That was his job, and he was excited about it. How many of you have ever met somebody that's got a dirty job to do but doesn't like it? Paul liked it. <laughs> he thought he was doing God a favor. Or Saul, if you're more comfortable with that, that side of the coin. And God says, look, Ananias, go see Saul. Seriously? I'm kind of hiding from this one. I know he's in town. I really don't want to see him. He's looking for people like me. And God said, no, you know, this vision is really good. Number one, I've already prepped Saul. He knows you're coming. <laughs> okay. And when you get there, I have great things in store for him. Do you realize that first century Christianity and modern Christianity will look very different if Saul didn't become Paul? This was a watershed. This was a turning point moment. God gave a vision to a Christian and said, you go there. You reach him. God didn't say to Ananias, you go build a church of a thousand on 2nd Street in Jerusalem. You go build the, the best music program, the best youth program, the best missions program that's ever been done in South Jerusalem, and I'll be happy with you. He said, you reach him. Who do you reach today? Who do I reach today? Right? The world in Howell, the world in Brighton, the world in Pinckney, the world in Fowlerville, the world in Cahokta could change if we reach the one person that God is sending us to. Can I, can I help? They're not just going to drive in 95% of the time. I know that happens. I mean, I do. I, I've met some. I, some of you have said, I was driving by and I came in. Thank you. That's awesome. But there's one. Two. Okay. Four, three. Okay, we're up to three. <laughs> Notice the whole three, even in this small crowd, is not anywhere near a huge percentage. But he draws from his people. He does. But he draws mostly from his people. Right? That's how it works. 
This required God's prep work. This required God's encouragement. This required God stiffening the spine of a believer who was afraid. But maybe this is a one-off, right? Maybe we shouldn't have any doctrine based on this because, you know, it just happened once. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Now this guy named Paul who Ananias went to and lived out his giftings to influence and reach this man. He didn't save Paul. Jesus saved Paul. But he pointed Paul to Jesus. Now Paul's on a run. We don't know what happens to Ananias after that. I'm assuming God, God was pretty happy with Ananias, at least for following that vision. But now we see Paul moving forward, and in verse 6 it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And we all go, all these names, oh, my mind is... You know. How many of you know where Asia is, the province of Asia? How many have your Roman time period map in your Bible? <laughs> Turkey. How strong of a great Christian community is there today in Turkey? Kind of on the road. Kind of not much. Kind of on the run, okay? Does that mean we shouldn't work in Turkey? No, and I'm not saying that. Paul said, man, I want to go to Asia. Asia, this province has is, is, is got, man, this is where it's happening. There's all kinds of people there. I already know there are believers there. And by the way, Paul would plant one of his greatest churches in Asia. It's a place called Ephesus. But right now, God said, um, no. After they had come to Mysia, now he's trying to go anywhere. They didn't come to Mysia. They tried to go to Bithynia. The Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now when he had seen the vision, after he had seen the vision, sorry, immediately he sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Do you realize that God did great works in the province of Asia, in Asia Minor, Turkey, in, in the early church? Sure he did. Some great leaders came out of there, but God said, Paul, your vision is to go to Macedonia. How many of you know Macedonia at one time had been a powerhouse, but not in the last couple hundred years? Not when Paul was walking around. It was kind of the poor backwaters of the empire. God said, go there. How many of you think that Paul might have gone, huh? doesn't sound very big. What am I going to go there for? What's going to come out of that? Do you realize that that's the place that the church was planted in Europe? 600 years later, the Christian message would continue in Europe. It would stop in Turkey. God knew what needed to be done. God preps the visions that are important and he directs whether they sound big to you and I or not when we understand what requires His presence, what requires His direction, we get behind it. Now how does this vision work? Four things. How do we go about making a positive impact and having a disproportionate influence spiritually in our community? It's a great sentence, but let's go on beyond that. First of all, motivation. People should be involved because our communities are our mission field. This is your church. This is your family. We need to train people here, encourage people here, pray for people here, hold them accountable here. All of that is true. All of that is part of the life of a disciple. But this is not your mission field. That is. Work is. The place that your kids are in a ball club, your ball team are. That's your mission field. Sometimes I think it gets so easy to simply focus on those things that are inside because they're definable and they're, they're limited. That looks big. That looks complicated. That looks time consuming. Maybe this is a little bit easier to, to bite that, that little bite off. But motivation saying we are people who are confident in the Christ we serve. God did not make us people who are so small that we cannot serve Him. We need to be people who are confident, we need to be aware of God's moving, and we need to choose to be assets in any community God plants us in. Amen? Not because of who we are, 
this isn't an arrogance thing. I'm, I'm not, even if you're saying, it'd be nice, wouldn't it, if your pastor looked at you and said, you are the smartest and most brilliant people ever. I mean, that feels nice. But folks, I hang in a lot of crowds that are way smarter than me. And I know that. That's not a critique of you, a critique of myself. I hang in crowds that are way smarter than I am. I know I'm not smarter than the average bear. But I know who knows where the picnic baskets are hidden. Amen. Amen. I know the Jesus who can motivate, who can change, who can move. And when I understand that that's his mission field, it becomes my mission field. People following Christ should be people that bring something amazing to the table because of who we serve. So sometimes it is a motivational question. How many of you have ever struggled with motivation? For that or any other thing? Okay. Like I said, my joke is when I look at ice cream, I struggle with motivation. I'm disciplined. I eat ice cream. I know how. I know why. But I'm not motivated not to. That, that, that's a problem. So we all struggle somewhere, somehow, with motivational issues, right? It's part of being a human being. But to say, God, motivate me to see my mission field. Second, training. We live in a time when people are terribly confused. And somehow they begin to think that confusion makes sense. Danielle and I have been talking about this week. You know, she, she's a, a major follower of uh, Ravi Zacharias and you know, the RZIM team. And they, they're apologists. And they're brilliant people who go into debates and college forums and other things and, and they share the good news of Jesus Christ and you know they, they, they sensibly set people on course that think that the Bible isn't real and that God isn't real and doesn't exist. and They do a brilliant job of it. How many of you ever heard any of Ravi Zacharias's people or him personally? You go, whoa, I wish I was that smart. I mean, you know, they, they really are amazing. Well, how many of you know that we all need as American Christians to be far more biblically literate? Yeah. And recently, some of our, our, our new general superintendent was over in the Melvindale area, and he, and he came in, and I didn't hear it, but some of the people here, Pastor Brian was there, and, and I think that uh, Jason Jones was there, and a few, Mitchell, did you go? No, no, to the, the thing over in Melvindale? I thought maybe you had gone. Okay, and, and he literally said, our G general superintendent said, you know, we need to be far more biblically literal, literate, even in the Assemblies of God. Yes. We need to get back to understanding doctrine. We live in a world that's so confused about what does it look like to be a Christian? And, and what are the things that God calls us to? And how much of our culture should we have versus, uh, you know, God's culture should we have? And where are the lines? I mean, we're not talking about legalism or having to earn, you know, earn it. God, I mean, Jesus is the only one that gives us salvation. We're not questioning that. But how does life get lived in the in-between? So many American Christians have a bit of confusion. And if you think American Christians do, how many of you have had conversations recently with people outside the faith? I mean, for any reason. You weren't necessarily trying to witness, you just talked to them. Have you heard some of the things that they think is, is sensible and right? We live in a world with phenomenal confusion. Who else is going to give them the answers if we don't find them in the Word? We are. So what we do is we train we commit to learning what we do not currently know. We commit to practicing communicating clearly what we do know and answering the questions that people have. Last week I said we learned to bowl by bowling. We learned to communicate by communicating. We learned to share by sharing. But we have to know what to share. We also have to know how to listen wherever we find ourselves. Influence and impact is not just what we do to others. It's how we listen to others. And we allow the Holy Spirit to say, this is the moment you jump in. This is the moment you speak. This is the moment you tell them that idea. And how many of you know that that's not often part of many of our natures? I mean, some of you in, in this room, you are grab the bull by the horns people. You're not afraid of nothing. And that's good. I think that's cool. I look at those people and go, wow. Not necessarily me. But wow. Right? How many of you are not necessarily grab the bull by the horns, kick the doors over, make it happen? How many of you may be a little quieter than that? 
maybe a little bit. Okay, it's funny. It's funny to watch you. Some of you, are, yeah. Some of you are going. Mm. <laughs> Should I admit to that? <laughs> you know. Okay. We get trained. We listen. We pay attention. We get ready to know when it's time to talk. Third. Target focus. Target focus. We need to strategically become involved in the web of our community. Strategically become involved in the web of our community. Did I say it loud enough? I just wondered, some of you are still there. Strategically become involved in the web of our community. That doesn't just mean, oh, I think I should do something. <laughs> It means, what should I do? And I'm going to tell you how to do that. How many of you know that we all have different interests? This isn't too hard to figure out. Um, I, I, I don't mind having conversations with any, especially the guys, football, baseball, okay, hockey. Maybe hockey is my favorite sport. But um, I'm not really a major sports fan. It's not too hard to figure, is it? I'm not picking on it. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying don't do it. It's just not really my thing. You know what I mean? I can play some of the games, not hockey, because I can't ice skate. <laughs> I would be a true hazard on the ice. Let me just tell you, ah! people would be taken out, be like ninjas on ice. It would not be a good thing. You know, I, I mean, okay, not my thing. But some of you, that's your thing. So when God looks at me and says, what do you know and what are you good at and how can you dive in, Jeff? I end up landing in all those social services and philanthropic and policy setting organizations. This is just where I land. It's, it's what I'm, I guess I'm good at. They keep asking me to do it. So either I'm good at it or I'm stupid and I say yes a lot. I don't know. But that's what I do. So I mean, you know, that's why I was doing what I was doing at 6.30 this morning. And that's, that's why I do what I do with the United Way and other places. Because that's how God has opened doors for me. Now, if you're sitting in this audience and you live and breathe soccer or baseball, great! Don't try to become me. That would be ridiculous. You be you. Show up for your, your son, your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter, your nephew, the kid down the street for all I care. Show up for their team sport. Encourage their coach. Say, this is where I can have an impact. If you have a passion for being at the gun club, go to the gun club and find a way to talk to people at the gun club. Preferably not pointing anything at them. <laughs> if you have a passion for women's Bible study, do a woman's Bible study. If you have a passion for serving in the beautification committee, go there and plant flowers for Jesus. I'm not making fun of that. I'm saying God isn't expecting you to become your neighbor. He's not expecting you to, be, to look like Jesus in the first century in terms of his interests. In terms of his character, yes. In terms of his passion for the Father, yes. But how many of you know Jesus doesn't expect all of us to become itinerant evangelists? You know, there are people in this room who look forward to what you guys do on Friday. They love it. They have no problem knocking on a door and saying, can I pray for you? But everybody in this room is not going to do that. And we know that. And it would be senseless to try to make anybody feel guilty about it. You've never heard Rick stand up and go, you losers! <laughs> You're not showing up on Friday! No! That's not the point. But you know what? You could show up at the soccer game and say, hey, can I say a prayer before we play? But can I tell you what to do before that? Take care of the equipment. Mentor a kid. Show up. Drive some people to the next game. Show yourself to be an excellent value to the team before you start shoving Jesus down their throat. Right? Build those relationships. Be somebody that that coach, that team president does not want to lose. We've got to have so-and-so. We can't have a good season if we don't have so-and-so. That's a person you want in the program. You're going to plant flowers for Jesus and plant flowers for be the best dog on flower planter you can be. I don't always know what's alive and what isn't. <laughs> but for those who do, do your thing. You guys sewn these dresses. I love it. You don't, I mean, I know, I've been told this several times. You do not have to be a sewer to help. True? True? I've got several ladies nodding there. You do not have to be a sewer. There are, you can be a cutter. You can be an organizer. You can be a packer. You can do lots of things. Generally, 
you, it, nobody's here probably ever seen my sewing skills. <laughs> and I'm assuming you probably don't want. I will say what I sew does not fall apart. <laughs> Let's just leave it there. I think you'd have to be pretty desperate as a young lady in the third world to want to wear my sewing. <laughs> but if you've got this gift, and obviously we have ladies and occasionally a man who does, Come out and sew for Jesus, man. Show up, bring stuff, find fabric on sale, bring it, be a part of it. You don't even have to do it here all the time. Maybe there's some other group someplace else that's doing it for people that live around here. Go find that and be the best they, this is target focus. Do you know where you will never find your target? Sitting at home, doing nothing. It's relaxing. I get it. We all got to relax. I'm not nailing anybody. I'm not saying terrible relaxers. <laughs> Man, you got to unwind. I get that. You lose your mind if you're running all the time. Cool. Play games. Have fun. Fire up the computer. Do whatever you do. Enjoy yourself sometimes. But you know what? Where you like to be, start wanting to be excellent there. Start showing the right attitude and the right competence for people to go, Man, what's going on with them? Because they will ask. They will. You show up with the right attitude and the right competence, and they will ask you to do things. They will want to know what makes you tick. Conversations will open up. And then the Holy Spirit can begin giving you words that make all the difference in your situation. For some of you, you know, but Pastor, you don't know I work so hard, and you do. That's not a sarcastic comment. Some of you work ridiculous hours. Maybe your mission field is at work. You'd be the best engineer, the best salesman, the best customer service individual, the best administrator, the best person that you can possibly be doing whatever it is that you do. And when your business says, man, we don't want to lose so-and-so. Say, you know, would you mind if I take our 15-minute break and I go and kind of have a short Bible study over there in the break room? It's a whole lot easier to get a yes out of a corporation when they need you and they know it than when they can't stand you and are looking for a way to let you go. <laughs> right? Yeah, you can do that. So then you become the person that's now mentoring somebody else. I want to make copies of me. I want people around here to have the same attitude, have the same passion for competence, so they come to Corporation X and they do the good, the good job. And the company goes, man, we want them to be a trainer. <laughs> I don't care if you don't like Jesus, you go and listen to them. <laughs> Maybe they'll rub off on you. Target selection, fourth, show excellence and make them want you on the team. That's how it works. When a church does that, when a church says our mission field is there, not just a nifty sign above the door, but our mission field is there. Our passion is there. When a church says, I want to get training, not because the pastor thinks I've got to have another class, but because there's something I don't know and I don't understand about out there that I want to understand better so I can do what Jesus wants me to do, not what the pastor wants me to do. When I know where my target is, when I have a passion for the people that God has put in my way, and I've made a commitment to excellence where I've got to be anyway, I mean, if you really want to go out there and be unexcellent and, is that a word, unexcellent? I think it is. <laughs> Whatever, you, I think you get the point. If you want to go out there, you just be miserable. Why don't you go out there and be everything that Jesus can make you be? And then look around. Will it matter if it's a small church or a big church? If Howell and Brighton and Pinckney and Fowlerville and Cahokta and wherever you're from, Unadilla, anybody? Oh, we got some folks that are at least close. Jeff, Jeff, you guys are almost there. Okay. If Heartland, Fenton, if your community knows you're coming and they say, man, we want them, they start asking, what are those Sunrisers doing? What is different about who you are? That matters. Now, what we want to do is walk in God's wisdom. Wisdom matters in everything, but wisdom is never automatic. It takes experience as well as training to know when to connect knowledge to life situations. James 3.13 and following, 
Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct. Is that not excellence? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Is that not excellence? But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, don't boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We people who show up to volunteer for food bank or gleaners or, you know, the literacy council or wherever it is God puts you. And so peace. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 chimes in. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. I believe that is God's view. I, I, you know, folks, I've seen churches, and, and please do not misunderstand me. If you misunderstand this, you're going to walk away and really, really not get where I'm going. Should we as a church be people of prayer? You better bet we better be people of prayer. We can't do this without Jesus Christ. This is not a pull yourself up by the bootstraps and shine type of a message. I'm not saying that it is, but I have met and talked to people in churches that have been praying for God to do something magical in their church for 50 years, and it ain't happened. Why? Yeah. God does not give visions to entertain us. That's right, that's right. God gives visions to mobilize us. Yes. So there will never be a vision that comes from God where we simply get to watch. Vision will always require us to do, to stretch. Always. That's how you kind of know Is it bigger than me? Will it stretch me? Will I need God in that spot? This should be our vision. And as I finish and get ready for communion, notice that I call it our vision. I'm not always sure. Sometimes, you know, sometimes if we don't know, how can it be ours? You see, here in America, it becomes common for congregations. I'm not blaming you for this. I'm just saying it's common in the world to assume that it's the pastor's job to bring vision to the church. We are a blank slate. We are here. You show up. You infuse. You infect us with your vision. And now we're all infected. Praise God. Can I tell you something? Eat wrong. Can I tell you why I think that's wrong? Pastors should be people of vision. I'm not saying that that's not true, but the vision should be yours. The pastor affects that vision, tweaks that vision, shakes that, shapes that vision a little bit with their gift set, with their personality, with their style, I get that. But if it's not your vision, what happens? I mean, hey, I'm not planning to go anywhere. I'm not making an announcement or anything. But, you know, someday I'm going to die or retire or the rapture is going to be the rapture. It happens well, your vision isn't a problem. But, I mean, outside of that, right? I mean, someday all things come to an end. And if somebody else comes and they have a totally different vision, we're going to start a school. 90 degree turn at speed. And everybody's got to figure out if they're going to fall off or not. Do you realize when you ever interview a pastor here or any other church you're at, you should be asking the pastor, how does your vision and passion fit ours? We're not waiting for you to give us a vision. We're waiting for you to shape and work and cooperate and motivate us in the vision God has already given us and that we have accepted. And I said earlier, I think this is part of who you are anyway. And I think it always has been. I have always said, and I don't say this just out of pastoral statement or pride, you punch above your weight. You are a small church that very much thinks like a medium church. You're not afraid to stretch out. Do you realize that you have never stopped supporting a missionary in 21 years 
and you are the only church in the state of Michigan that can say that? You have never, you have never dropped the missionary support in 21 years. Nobody else can say that. Have we had hard times? Uh-huh. Have we had years that we had to like take a machete and a, you know, and a nuke through our budget? Uh-huh. But you've never stopped. That's not a church that gives up. You have done because you believe that missions matters. Gay team. You've sent missions teams here and there to make a difference. You've jumped into high school assemblies because somebody said, hey, you can do it. All right, we can do it. You know, you're the first ones that ever tried to tackle the Halloween problem downtown. You're the only one that ever done it. Good for you. It's part of who you are. I didn't make you that way. I've just helped a little bit. And that's how it should be. So I hope at the end of this message we don't say, oh, that's pastor's vision. Great. No, it had better be your vision. Because then, no matter whatever happens to me, you know who you serve and what he called you to, and you're ready to do it with anyone leading. Amen? Your faith should never be dependent on me. I am not your fuse. If I burn out and your faith dies, oh, bad! Yeah, don't burn out. I don't want to. I'm just saying, hey, it's the point. We want to make sure that we are people that say this is our vision. I, I, I like this crazy idea. For 21 years, this has been my crazy idea. Can I tell you what? Do you realize that your church staff, and several others of you, not just your staff, but your church staff is involved in so many different community things? There's only so much of us to go around. I'm not asking you to do our job. That's not the point. The things we've chosen to do, we like to do. And we do because it fits our giftings. And it fits the opportunities that the Holy Spirit has given us. And I wouldn't change any of that. But it's time for more and more of you to find out how you can join us. To say, I can do this on the ball field, in the work crew. I can do this in the, 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 the ministry to the needy. I can do this in the beautification committee, building something, encouraging something. I can do this in the nursing home where I'm gonna go encourage somebody, love somebody, and tell them that we are still watching and paying attention. I can do this when I can offer prayer on a Friday night, first of the month, to people who may not know Jesus Christ at all. I can do this because you can. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? And I'm going to ask my deacons to come up to the platform, if you would, please. I said, visions are something that any pastor can tell you about. And a lot of pastors use visions to rally the base and encourage the troops to do what they want them to do. I want to do what we do together. This is deliverable only by the power of God, only by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is not deliverable by my skills. It is deliverable as God encourages, plants, trains, mobilizes you. How many of you say, I want to do that? No, I didn't tell you where to go. I just said you got to go. How many of you say, okay, I, I can follow that. I can go someplace. I can make the best dresses I know how. I can share prayer with people who don't know Jesus. I can encourage people in a Bible study at work. I can be the best that I can be on the ball field and tell people about Jesus and mentor them along the way. I've got about five hands. Lord Jesus, you see our hands. And maybe, Lord, for those who are still trying to wrap this through their brain and say, do I believe this? Do I want this? Is this what I need to do? Lord Jesus, I, I ask you to help us see this is to some degree what you did. You came down and you were awesome at what you did. You're, I mean, I know you're God, I get that, but you're this amazing communicator. You were fully involved in the lives of the people around you. You spoke at their level, in their interest, doing things that made a huge difference for them. And the crowds ran to you. They wanted to see who you were and what answers you had. And God, I don't think in our really screwed up world that that formula has ever changed. 
You have called us as people to be your hands extended, to be your representatives. And Lord Jesus, I believe that's what you've called Sunrise to be. To make a difference. To have an impact. To have a totally disproportionate number of people from this little church following their giftings in the Holy Spirit in the interest areas that they have to be the best that they can be so that Jesus is spoken again and again in areas and decisions are made based on Holy Spirit imparted truth. God, if we do that right, and all the numbers, all the programs, all the other stuff flow. So God, you've seen our hands. And Lord, I know that even those who haven't thought it through, or maybe they're just not big hand wavers, Lord, I pray that you would touch and encourage and help them to see this is my vision, not Jeff's vision. This is my vision. Insert their name there. This is what I want to be. And then begin to take them through that process of motivation and training and target focus and excellence. Well, Jesus, I ask this in your precious name, and I trust that you can do it. Amen. And amen. In Scripture, and in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. We practice an open communion. You do not need to be a member of this church. You do not need to be, you know, assemblies of God in your theology. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want you to celebrate with us. We want you to take communion. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I can't think of a better time to stop and say, I need Jesus Christ right now. Would you come into my life, Lord, and make a difference? If you do, we welcome you right now today. Please take I ask you to come, receive the elements, and when we have all been served, we'll partake together. Would you come? How many of you know when they stood there for the first communion, what Jesus was doing was really transferring vision in some sense, wasn't he? He had lived and walked and talked and done miracles and done incredible things in the world for three years of ministry. And he knew that the next day, the whole issue of the cross was going to come into reality. And he was transferring vision from himself. This wasn't Jesus' vision that they were just doing for him. That became the disciples' vision. They said, we go out, we take risks, we reach our world, we jump into whatever God wants us to jump into. And of course, at that point, their goal was all pretty much preaching because like nobody knew the truth. They did. And they were going to share it. God has placed you in lots of places and some of you can preach and I want you to and I hope you do and I'll encourage you in every way as you do it. I'll help teach you if you don't know how. But I realize a lot of us aren't really wanting to be preachers and that's okay. We get a chance to be excellent wherever God plants us. Lord Jesus, our excellence though won't save us and it never could. It's always been about your sacrifice. It's always been about your grace. It's always been about your love. So Lord, we as very real, very broken, very imperfect people stand before you. Lord Jesus, we realize that in our own strength, we can never do anything to impress you or earn our place. But you died on the cross so that Father God sees your righteousness 
your holiness in our lives. And so, Lord, we thank you as we hold the bread, which we're reminded was your body broken. Lord, we know so many people that need healing, need touch, need restoration. And Lord, we believe in Isaiah 53 and other places. Lord, we are told that your broken body is what gives healing its power. So, Lord Jesus, we ask you that you would heal those that are broken. We ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would touch us in our own mind, our own hearts. And sometimes, even though we're saved and we love you and we're walking in your power, still, Lord, sometimes we have issues in our own mind that need your strength, your wisdom, and your healing. So, Lord Jesus, we ask you to do this, and we know in advance it can be done. Can we partake together of the bread? Thank you, Jesus. We also hold the cup. And we know that, Lord Jesus, our spiritual future for eternity relies on that shed blood. And we're thankful. We're thankful that you've done for us what we can never do for ourselves. That your vision was so amazing that it extended salvation to everyone who would call on your name. Thank you. Now, Lord Jesus, we ask you that you touch those that we know. We know them at work. We know them on the team. We know them in the neighborhood. We know them in the club. We see them. They're waitresses and, and servers at restaurants, and they work in stores, and we know them, and we have a pretty good idea that they don't know Jesus. But we ask you that they come to know Jesus. And we pray that somehow you use us in that. And for some of us, that might be hospitality. For some of us, that may be craftsmanship. Some of, that, some of that might be mentoring. Some of that might be sharing faith directly and preaching. I don't know. But Lord, use us. Show them the good news. We thank you for our salvation as we partake of the cup together this morning. Now, Lord Jesus, the mission field is always out there. So let us go get it. Let us go begin to see how we can be used of you to make it happen. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I've said it before, but go get them, man. <laughs>